Hey folks, welcome back. You made it. This is part two for the intro to caching in ArcGIS Pro. If this is your first time here, welcome to the Carter Redux channel. My name's Tommy. And if you missed part one, you can find that over here. And uh, I'll make sure I put a link to that video down in the description as well. Now, as I mentioned in the first video, we're focusing on caching workflows exclusively in ArcGIS Pro. But if you want to know more about caching with ArcGIS Enterprise, I'll put a bunch of links in the description below from some previous technical workshops that myself and Grima gave at the, the Esri User Conference as well as the Esri Dev Summit. Now, if you don't have ArcGIS Enterprise at your disposal or you don't want to burn oodles of credits by generating cash in ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Pro is a rock solid alternative for generating cash locally on your laptop, your workstation, whatever you got. Now, there are several geoprocessing tools that you're gonna to need to learn about. And I wanna show you the ones that I prefer to use for my cache projects. There are five that we're gonna be talking about in this video. Three for rash tiles. Those are create map tile package, manage tile cache, and export tile cache. And then finally two for the vector tile projects. And that's the create vector tile index and the create vector tile package. Now this is just caching. We're not talking about publishing or sharing or anything like that just yet. I'll have videos coming out shortly talking about those topics in particular. There are a few different ways that you can find these geoprocessing tools in ArcGIS Pro. New with Pro 2.8, you got that cool uh, new command search. Just type it in there, boom, launch the geoprocessing tool. You could also find these tools by doing a search inside the geoprocessing pane. And when you locate them there, you can also add them to your favorites so that you don't have to keep looking for them. They're just right there. Pretty cool time saving technique. I like it. Just as a word of caution, navigating the caching ecosystem is uh it's a bit it's a bit murky it's likely that you may come across the caching tool set within the server tools toolbox these are not the geoprocessing tools we're looking for these tools as the name implies require arcgis server or arcgis enterprise to do the caching what we want is for arcgis pro and the machine where pro is running to do all the caching. And for that, we want these geoprocessing tools over here, over in the data management toolbox. Here are those uh, those five geoprocessing tools again in their native habitat. I'm gonna be honest, I don't really look at the toolbox view much anymore. I usually just rely on search. So, yep, there you go. There's a, there's a pro tip for you. So we're gonna talk about three scenarios. And for each of these three scenarios, there are two things that we want to accomplish. One. We want to host our content, our tile layer, in ArcGIS Online. So that's gonna be our hosting mechanism. Two, we wanna be able to combine the maps that we create, the base maps that we create with other Esri base maps. Now, these two requirements mean some very specific things from a design perspective. One, we need to create our maps as a tile package or a vector tile package. That's what ArcGIS Online needs in order to deploy our hosted tile layers. Two, we wanna make sure that we're using the ArcGIS Online tiling schemes. So all three of these scenarios are gonna be maps that are in, as much as it pains me to say it, the Web Mercator coordinate reference system. You go wash my mouth out after saying that. Scenario number one, let's talk about the create map tile package geoprocessing tool. This is gonna work well if you've got some basic imagery or a basic map uh, with a very generic or regular extent, so a square or a rectangle extent. This could also be just a, a single raster data set that you want to generate cash for. Now where this geoprocessing tool really excels is if you're going directly from a map to a tile package, once and done, and then you upload that to ArcGIS Online. The other cool thing about this geoprocessing tool is it leverages something called parallel processing. In other words, we're gonna bring some additional system resources to bear and get through the job faster. Many hands makes light work or whatever the old adage is. Now, generally I will just set this to 100% and let it cruise overnight. But if I'm gonna be doing work on my computer during the day, in addition to generating cash, I'll probably dial this down to like 75%. It actually is gonna calculate that based on the number of CPUs that you have. So if you've got eight cores, 75%, it's only gonna use six of those cores for this cash job. But again, any additional processing that you can bring to bear will get through the job faster. Now, I'm not gonna lie, um, 
I'm not a huge fan of this tool. I find the level, the minimum and maximum level of detail parameters a little bit confusing to navigate. Let's take a couple of seconds just to talk about that. This is actually, th this implies that you've got some innate knowledge about tiling schemes and tile or level of detail IDs, which is the numbers that they're being, that are being referred to here. Let, let's take a few seconds and show you where to find this information. And then I'm going to give you a little cheat sheet that way you don't have to constantly dig around for these things in the future. So here's an example of a tiling scheme file. It's just an XML and it's going to have all those components that we talked about over in part one. We've got our spatial reference. Here's our web Mercator reference. It's got our tile origin again, where we start our numbering for our rows and columns. It has our tile dimensions. 256 by 256. This is a raster tile. Then we've got all of our levels of detail. All right, we have our scales, our resolution, and here's those fancy level IDs that this geoprocessing tool is expecting us to know something about. Well, here's where you could find that. Now, while this is fun and again can be a bit cumbersome to navigate and a bit daunting to navigate if you've never looked at one of these things before, I'm also going to put a link in the description below for this cheat sheet. This is basically showing three of the most common tiling schemes that are available inside the ArcGIS ecosystem. Now we've got Web Mercator and GCS WGS84. There's two flavors of GCS WGS84. Don't worry about that for right now. Let's just focus on Web Mercator and the raster tile column. All right, so we focus on this. Let's just say, for example, we want to generate cash for this map at 592 million or level zero for the Web Mercator tiling scheme. And uh, we've determined that it's appropriate to cash this down to one to 4,000. Well, that would equate to level 17, the tiling scheme. So let's take that information and go back to our geoprocessing tool. So now that we understand where these level IDs are coming from and how you can look them up in the future, there's still one critical limitation, if I can be honest, which is honestly kind of a deal breaker for me. Uh, and that's this extent parameter. Now, I understand the, 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 the idea here that we're gonna go directly to a tile package. So this really doesn't work well if we're gonna be getting frequent updates to our base map. Again, if we've just got a single data set that we wanna create and do that one time and then upload that to ArcGIS Online, this is the tool to use. But again, and I was very particular to mention square extents or rectangular extents because the extent is only gonna let you choose the envelope or the extent of your map frame, right? So if you've got irregular content, irregular data, well, that means you're gonna be generating a lot of extra tiles because we can't constrain it to, to be a more detailed polygon. So let's use this as an example. So if we've got some complex imagery or multiple raster data sets with irregular edges or non-contiguous regions, if we draw the envelope or the extent of this data set, Everything in white is essentially blank tiles that we're going to be wasting time and storage on generating. Now, if we can eliminate that from the equation, our tile package is going to be much smaller and it's going to generate in a fraction of the time. We're not going to be spending all that time generating tiles that have nothing. They're, they're blank tiles, but it still occupies disk space and it still takes time to create those things. My personal preference and this leads to the next scenario. I like to use um, a two-step process. I prefer to use manage tile cache, which is gonna create a cache data set, which we talked about in the first video. Then from that cache data set, we can use the export tile cache to convert that to a tile package, which is now a thing that we can take and publish to ArcGIS Online. We can actually specify a detailed area of interest, right? That's what I really like about this tool. And the, the UI is a lot cleaner as well. We've got scales that we can interact with now, check boxes. This actually does lend itself to that workflow of periodic updates rolling in. We could have a cache data set on disk. We can make updates to our data, and then we can just use a polygon where those updates need to happen. Now, one uh, pro tip on this one, make sure you zoom to the full extent of your data before you hit go on the managed tile cache. Whatever polygon you specify, it'll also only display the cache tiles that are within the current view extent. So make sure you zoom to the full extent before you run the geoprocessing tool. Also for the export tile cache, 
you're going to want to pick the same levels of detail that went into the Manage Tile Cache Geoprocessing Tool. And if you've got it laying around, you can also use the Area of Interest Polygon to speed up the, the tile package creation. We're using two tools here. Some folks have commented in the, fa in the past, like, well, the, the Create Map Tile Package tool goes right to a tile package, so it's faster. These two tools run sequentially, do exactly the same thing as the Create Map Tile Package tool with finer control over where to generate the cache, what levels of detail to generate the cache in a much more uh, intuitive way, if you ask me. So again, this is my preference. I prefer using this for my raster tile projects. And again, this works for all raster tile projects, whether it's imagery, vector content as raster tiles, elevation data, form of tinted hill shade or aspect or slope, as well as that fancy lurk tile that we were talking about before, we can actually create those elevation surfaces using the Manage Tile Cache tool as well. That's it for raster tiles, two geoprocessing tools. That's all you need. But what about vector tiles? Well, thankfully, vector tiles are a little bit more straightforward. Turning your vector content into a vector tile tile set is going to leverage a process that I have termed the DIY approach. Now, there is an alternate approach to doing this, but again, I like to exert a little bit more control over the process. The two geoprocessing tools that we're going to use for vector tiles are the Create Vector Tile Index. Now, this is actually an optional step, but um, I like to do it because uh, it provides some additional insight into my data. It gives me a sense for how big my vector tile project is going to be. The Create Vector Tile Index tool is going to analyze the density of our map and then build a polygon, build a grid, which is essentially the to-do list for the next geoprocessing tool. But it's going to determine the depth of cache that we need based on the density of our features. Let me say that another way. We're only gonna generate tiles at the largest levels of detail where we have the dense features to support and to warrant those deep levels of cache. Now in the graphic here, these blue grids, the really small polygons, those are the largest levels of detail. So back to the level IDs, this is like the 16, 15 or 14 level IDs, the 4K, the 9K, the 18K in our tiling scheme. But you'll notice that those small squares aren't everywhere in our map. And that's because we were able to fit all the geometry that we need into a smaller level of detail, a smaller scale. Let's just say, look at this large region out over by uh, the Hudson River. In that tile, we were able to encode the full fidelity geometry of the ferries, the buildings, the coastline, the roads, all in that small scale tile, that large tile. Those polygons actually equate to tile, the actual tile extents themselves. Now, what does this mean? Once we zoom past that tile, because it's so zoomed out, what happens when we zoom past it? You've got the full fidelity geometry in that one tile. We're going to continue to draw the map as you zoom past. So chances are, when you're looking at a vector tile base map, you're actually looking at a tile that was streamed several levels of detail ago. Right? This is called overzooming. Now, because of this indexing process, we can be a little bit more um, aggressive with that overzoom. Right? Now, the index also has the added benefit that we only generate the tiles at largest scales that we absolutely need. So fewer tiles to generate means a smaller tile package, vector tile package, as well as a faster cook time. Our processing time is much faster because we're generating fewer tiles. So yeah, the index is super cool, but it's also got the added benefit of when you use a vector tile package or a vector tile layer within the Esri JavaScript API, that index helps make for a more efficient tile request process. Because now the API is aware of where tiles exist, as well as when to stop requesting tiles and to start over zooming. So it makes for a more efficient process. In creating a vector tile package, we're going to use the aptly named create vector tile package geoprocessing tool. We'll specify our map, we'll specify our output location, and we'll add our index polygon that we built in the previous step. Now, the other pro tip here is for that maximum cache scale, hit that drop down and scroll all the way to the bottom and pick the largest scale, right? The smallest value in that pick list. Um, that's just, uh, 
that'll save you an additional step later on that uh, is a bit of an annoyance. So just set that to the maximum in that list, tiling scheme scales, and you're all set. And that's it for cache generation in ArcGIS Pro. Four geoprocessing tools, right? That's all you need to cook raster tiles and vector tiles and make some sweet, sweet base maps. So keep an eye out on the channel for the next round of videos in this series where we'll start to tackle specific base map projects and we'll take them from start to finish, from design all the way through publishing and deployment. With that said, until then folks, take care and uh, I'll see you in the next one. See ya.